good afternoon everybody um i hope you're hope you're well um my name's tom i'm the bfi network exec for the southeast region based at the film hub southeast um pleased to welcome you to today's uh, bfi network live talk um i'm really grateful to join kobe uh, for the time this afternoon and to give you all the opportunity to hear from what i think are two of the most important people in the industry right now um okay. Please, uh, throughout the talk, feel free to type in any questions that you might have. Uh, there's a Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, you see, and they will be able to uh, look at that. So if you do have any questions for Joe and Kobe, please do type it in there. And um, we aim to get through them as many as we can throughout the talk or during the end of it. Um, okay, I'm going to hand you over to them now, and I'll see you later. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Tom. Hi, everyone. Thank um, you, Tom. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I guess this will be a pretty like informal chat, wouldn't it, Kobe? Yes, that you'll be leading and I'll be following. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm joking, we'll all chip in. We'll all chip in. I mean, I guess we're going to be talking about um, how we have gotten to where we are, which is starting from um, making house girl. So yeah. I met Kobe when he was in his final year at London Film School. Yes. Um, I was making shorts, um, hustling out there in the real world, and Kobe put out uh, an ad looking for a producer. And I think when you put the ad out, you also included your short film Closure as well. Mm -hmm. um, I remember seeing Closure, and I was like, oh, okay, like he knows what he's doing right, so this, this, this can be good. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> there's a second Kobe attached to himself. <laughs> oh, there's, there's four Kobe's attached, what's going on? Anyway, um, but yeah, when, when, when we, but we met and we, and we spoke. Oh my God. Oh, oh, who's is that? Who's that? Is that Cornelius? Um, can we get our new Kobe Adom to maybe, oh yeah, turn off the camera and mute that. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. So like, um, yeah, we met and we spoke and we met about House Girl and we, so basically, House Girl was an incredibly ambitious short that, I'm not going to lie, there was a time in which we didn't think we were going to actually make it because Kobe was like, I want to shoot this film in Ghana. And everyone was like, you want to do what? It's like, you're finally a film and you want to go to Ghana and shoot it. Um, why don't you talk about your thought process around House Girl? Yeah, I think, you know what, uh, that was me coming to the end of my film school education and looking at all the films that... Um, were being made. Um, they were being made in different places like Venezuela, you know, the Amazon rainforest, you know, Brazil and different parts of the world that, you know, I just thought were beautiful. And because I didn't know too much about those things, it kind of made me, motivated me to want to shoot elsewhere. So, and also another part of me wanted to reconnect back to Ghana quite a bit because I hadn't been back there in about 18 years by this point. So I thought to myself, you know, aesthetically, you know, that's something that would be new and challenging to me. And after going there once and just exploring, I kind of saw how beautiful the landscape was and decided I wanted to shoot there. So I think that, you know, I, that was the main reason for me to go and be so ambitious because I wanted to show, you know, use what I've learned from film school to present a whole different world, which is even alien to me. So, and how interesting it was to me. So it'd be interesting to represent that to other people. So obviously, and as you can imagine, someone that hasn't been there in 18 years and a country that doesn't know too much about what the film industry is like in Ghana. It was like a stab in the dark, especially in terms of the finances and, and putting things together. And actually, Joy is the only person who actually believed in the idea from scratch, which to this day seems to be a bit of a mystery for me as to why she, she thought that was possible. But honestly, I spoke to about three or four producers, you know, who kind of, I don't know if they were just intrigued by, <laughs> you know, this insane idea, but kind of vanished thereafter and joy just seemed to just stick you know and that's yeah but i think that's also because i think after seeing closure i could see that okay you've got something and you, and you had ambition and i think um when whenever you're making shorts you always you always need to be able to outdo your last one you, mm -hmm. you can never be on the same uh, level playing field when you're trying to make short films so I think for me it was like, okay, so somebody who definitely wants to, to go places. And also, who, who, who doesn't love a challenge and a trip back to Ghana to just hang out? Mm -hmm. Although we didn't realize how crazy it was going to be. But I'll fast forward a little bit to like, you know, we've got our team together. 
Um, we know we know what we're going to do, and we're trying to raise. Was it twenty k on Kickstarter? It was actually ten. It was ten k on Kickstarter. Yeah, it was actually ten, and I think that was just because uh, we're trying to do it in chunks, where it's like, okay, we get the money for production and stuff, you know, to get moving, and then it was kind of like this exercise of faith that <laughs> that the rest of the money would somehow come along, you know, yeah, and um, and but. I remember the the night that the Kickstarter was was basically coming to an end. Mm. We had only raised like was it four grand? Yes. So it was, it was like it was no, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a night. It was three days before the end. No, no, it was it was a night before because like we were making plans. Mm. Oh, I was making plans plan B's. Budget <laughs> on, on, on what our plan B budget was. Yeah. I was like, we've got to fly all these people to Ghana, and yeah. we're, we're lacking like. 6k or whatever yeah, it was, yeah, it was. So like i was making plans as to how we're gonna do it because i think we're planning on going in like two or three weeks or something mm -hmm. and then we had one person give us two grand one person give us four grand three grand, three yeah. grand and four yeah. grand just before the, the fine the final like few hours yeah. of the kickstarter campaign whom yeah. we've never actually met Mm. Oh, we don't know who they are to be fair. No, you know what? They were actually like anonymous people. And I think that, you know, around that time, I was working full time at Netapool Tate. It's actually funny. Like, I was doing full time there, going to film school, doing the Kickstarter, just killing myself as you do. Do you know what I mean? And it's sort of like, you know, we're going. And I, I remember we did a lot of like PR and sent out press releases to like, you know, The Voice magazine and, you know, just local newspapers and just trying to be as savvy as we could in that sort of PR marketing department. So I think that may have had a part to play in it with it and um, I actually remember there's a lady who while I was driving home from work one time hit the back of my car and I remember thinking to myself oh mate I'm already as stressed enough as it is so you know I don't know if I should bother to take your details and, and I said you know what darling don't worry about it you know what I mean just and she could tell like she was sort of like oh is there any way I can help so I said well I'm making a film you know what I mean if you want to contribute a little 10 or 20 quid or something <laughs> you know what I mean That'll be lovely. So that could have been an, another option, but yeah, you know that cool. time was very surreal when the money just came back. Like I, I remember, I was actually driving home and I got one email saying two grand. I was like, oh, that's a lot of money. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then ten minutes later, after like calling around, then the next bit of money came, and I was like, wow, that is that is it phenomenal. It was phenomenal. Um, and then we we go to. Well, I didn't go to Ghana for. I think I had something else happening in London. Mm. But these lot went to Ghana, and then it was a whole madness. I mean, oh my I, think, I, think, I think Obi grew like 10 years <laughs> when it was in Ghana for 10 days. Oh, man. A year for him. Why don't you talk about that experience filming House Girl in Ghana? You know what? It was, it was really strange because, you know, Joy was fully committed. And what I really liked about Joy is that, obviously, even though she couldn't come anymore, she sort of introduced me to a lot of trustworthy people that could kind of have a structure. And I think that, you know, on paper is what saved the project because actually I think that if we didn't know, have people with any kind of know-how could have easily just slid through the gaps and that's the end of the film, you know? And I think I took a, a few people from film school out there as well. The fact is every single day there was a calamity, like there was something crazy that went wrong. You know, like for example, the house we were in, all of a sudden a mysterious light came on in a mysterious room. You know, and, you know, when we first got there, it's sort of like those issues of passports and, you know, cars that it was just really strange. Like it was like me for someone who wasn't really that savvy with Ghana at the time, even though like I've lived there when I was younger, it was it was strange. And I think that, you know, I had, I had a lot of faith in that moment because, you know, I'm always reading my Bible. There was like two sort of Bible quotes that or sermons from my church that stuck with me, you know, sort of like to do with faith, you know, just sort of stick through like all these hardships and just, you know, whatever happens, just know that it's not going to, you know, it's not going to, it's not going to go away. If you know what I mean, it's, it's like, yeah. just, just persevere. And I think that that is what I learned from shooting in Ghana, shooting house girl. And it was really close knit family and even joy as a point of contact. If you know what I'm saying to you, so it was all going through this wilderness, you know, and I remember I came with like a, a shot list of like 86 shots um, and then Joy and everyone else is like, Kobe, you're probably going to get about 30 of these. <laughs> and I was like, oh, man. But you know what? There was bad things, but I have to also talk about the good things. You know, sort of like Joy introduced me to a really, really special production designer called Marco Tusic. And yeah. he was like so good, man. He was someone who's Croatian and Italian or something like that. And he's, you know, probably, he's probably been to Africa once. And, you know, he sort of goes out into town and then comes back with these seamstresses and, you know, 
these people that just come into our big house that we're in that we all shared you know sewing curtains sewing bed sheets and you know he was getting sort of like art, art, African arts you know to sort of like build the house with and you know what he did you know with the little that we had was amazing to me I woke up one morning after being stressed the night before and I woke up and I saw downstairs when I came down from the house like it was like the production like house. So how would you what would you call it, Joy? The production base. The production unit base slash slash location. Location. <laughs> yeah, everything in one. But it's like everyone, there was a structure, you know, people like sort of like, okay, cool, we need to do this by this time, lunch at this time. The seamstresses were all in yeah. one corner with Marco, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it was it was a it was a it was an experience, man. It was it was a it was a faith based experience. The walking in the dark, but we made it, you know, we, we um, did it. I'm going to ask a question that just popped up just because I think it's also part of this, uh, what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. But, um, uh, Sabrina, did, mm. did you ever feel you were not legitimate to tell the story you told, like, to tell House Girl that's because it was in Ghana as well? That's a, that's a great question. I think um, constantly I felt like, wait, am I, am, am I exactly, am I, am I qualified to tell stories about yeah, Ghana? We had this conversation, we did, yeah. Yeah, we had this conversation. It's sort of like, how much do you know about Ghana? But I think, you know, the saving grace of, 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 me telling the story is that I was actually telling my story in a weird way, if you know what I mean. It's sort of like not telling the story of what happened in terms, more in terms of characterizing the film, the experiences that I went through. You know, like at the beginning of the film, you have Jennifer, who's the lead, sort of like the, the driver taking her to the house and then he runs out and leaves her by herself and then somebody else sort of comes and sells her water while she feels vulnerable, etc. Like I actually went through that, you know, and, and you know, sort of like, that helped me to recreate an experience of what I actually went through as opposed to telling a film about Ghana, which I don't know. So like, you know, the, and the main character is someone who comes from the West going to Ghana for the first time, you know, and I think that that again gave me that confidence to really just um, present what I saw when I went to Ghana, you know, a couple of months before we shot and the experience that I went through and then merge that with the actual story that I'm telling. So I think that it really allowed me to tell a, a detailed, you know, enough film to be, valid 100 percent. you know and, and we and when we, before we made the film we spoke about that thing of um <clears throat> someone from the west going into you know back to your home country and and having this whole idea of like i can save you mm -hmm. uh, but not understanding actually mm -hmm. what is happening mm -hmm. um because you know even that scene of when um i forget her name but you know jennifer, uh, jennifer, jennifer. thank you when <laughs> Imagine. It was five like, years ago, mate. No. When <laughs> Jennifer um, gives F1 like the money and he's mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, take this. It's sort of like, but what is that going to do in the grand scheme of things? Mm -hmm. Because actually you don't understand what her situation is. Exactly. And just because you have pounds doesn't mm -hmm. mean you can change her life. Exactly. So I think even when talking about the film from that perspective, it definitely felt like a story you could tell um, mm -hmm. and a story that you could own as well. Definitely, definitely. And you know what? I think the great thing is the plot points in that film, the, the, the clearest and strongest ones came from my mum. And I think this story is something that my mum went through, you know, and she's obviously wasn't a British girl going to Ghana. She was just a Ghanaian woman who got to travel the world, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and see other things. So she wasn't, you know, really supposed to see these things because she was never stood in one place for, you know, for, for 10, sec 10 minutes. So... Yeah, I think that I took all the stuff that mum was telling me and then applied my perspective of it by saying, oh, I wonder what that would be like for someone first coming to the country yeah. and then merge those two together. You know, and I think that was actually quite an organic process mm -hmm. because I didn't really have to do much research. I wasn't trying to tell bits of Ghana that I don't know. It was just more about, you know, telling it through this lens. And I guess that's what makes it, you know, makes it stand out when it's a, a, a story that's told with such a specific lens. You know? Yeah, and like I said, a story, a story that you know, um, which takes us to like the next part of our, our journey. So after that, after we did... Oh, have, so, um, yeah, let's talk about the gap in the middle where, where you vanished and came back middle. and bought me 20 cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> so after House Girl, um, uh, you were going to do, you, you had a feature film idea yeah. you wanted to do. Yeah, um, yeah. at this thing called um, and you and you went to Modern Tales mm. which was run by um, Anjali and Femi at the mm. time um, which was all about you know helping you to develop a feature film idea um, I wasn't initially producing that feature film mm. um, oh god the unnamed <laughs> the unnamed party was producing that feature film yeah. um, 
And then I came at the end of that. And I think at this point in time in my life, what had happened, I had gotten on BFI Flair. Uh Um, Ben was my mentor, still is. Uh Um, And I had just spent like a whole year just like learning stuff about the industry, just meeting people, sales, everything, just understanding and taking all this different knowledge. Um, and I think, wasn't that when we had this cop? The, our cop yeah, like she just came out of nowhere. You know, you just sort of don't hear from, from Joy for a while. And he's like, hey, Kobe, you know, we should, we should get some food. And I was like, well, you know, I can't say no to food. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I didn't really have much money. So obviously it's like, yeah, that would be nice. And we went for a catch up. And I just remember thinking, the Joy was, you know, coming with all these new information. I was thinking, wait, well, hold on a minute, mate. Now, when was making ass go? <laughs> he didn't know all this and then she was just buying me cocktail after cocktail and then I was just I was after the, about the 10th one I was like mate you're, you're into some money here that I'm not I'm not you know what I mean but it was good it was good it was a good sort of reconnection because it was a good she reconnection. Came, you came at a time when the relationship with the previous producer I was working with was getting fractured so it's kind of like you didn't come for the sake of it you came yeah. to plug a gap um, and I think that you know, there forward, the key thing you said to me at that time is, Kobe, I think you need to do another short. And I was like, yeah, nah. And after that, that's when my interest started to <laughs> deplete. I was like, I'm not doing another short film. I can't be bothered. After House Girl took everything out of me. Yeah. And I was sort of like, I've done that now. So let me go on and, you know, grab the beast by the scruff of the neck. But I um, think you said, you know, do another short film. So do another yeah. short film. And so... Uh, because also I think what happened was because when you and the other producer you kind of like felt like you know you stopped working together and then you came to me and you were like oh do you want to produce this feature film I'm doing and I said okay cool but you got to do one more short film and you were like, <laughs> that was the requirement I was like nah it's all good <laughs> um, but at the end you were like all right cool I'll do the short film and so what we did was that oh uh, god so Kobe sent me a bunch of ideas <laughs> Some I was like, nah, nah. And you, you were getting on my nerves. I remember every time she go, no, Kobe, that's not it. I was like, how do you flipping know? You know what I mean? <laughs> what do you mean to say, Nick? I was getting so annoyed because it's like I really didn't want to do this, you know, short film, and I'm sort of sending scripts and ideas like, mm. and just like, mm, it's good, but you know, mm. and then you know, the the, the big thing happened eventually. Yeah. And no, then he no, sent no, no, through no. haircut for short, like the like a first draft. Before we get there, I have to speak about how that even came about in the first place. Okay. Right. So beginning of 2017, I met um, Ashley Waters, and that's because after he saw House Girl that we made, and he was like, "Oh wow, like uh, you know, it's really a black guy directed this kind of thing." You know, that's 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 great. Threw his number at me, so we met up a few times, um, and actually, what he said was really valuable to me because you're sort of like hey yeah you know i think you're great so write another short film you know and let's see if i can i can get involved with it you know get you know even acting it etc etc but when he said that because i was sort of like not really doing much for the rest of the year but developing the feature like i kind of lost sight of what he said and then there's this thing that happened in my barbershop as well that kept playing in my head like mom's story of house girl kept playing in my head this did the same thing so I remember I eventually got a job that year because I quit work at the start of 2017. Um, and, I, and I was really down and out. And then I started working. I hated this job. And these times I was fasting. So I fast sometimes just to reconnect with God. And I was fasting and praying a lot. I was walking home. And I remember when I was walking home from the station, I was just praying. I was like, God, please, man, you know, I hate this job. <laughs> you know, I, feel, I feel like it's, it's killing me inside. Like, you know, this is not what I went to film school for, rare, rare, rare. And um, just help me, et cetera, et cetera. And then the next thoughts that came to me, like literally two in quick succession, was the first thing is, Ashley Waters said, write a short film, and I'm acting it. So I'm just like, well, I'm here sort of like saying, oh, give me away, give me away, when that's been there the whole time. And then before I even finished that thought, then the, the barbershop story that keeps playing in my head came up. And that same night, I went home and I wrote the first draft in six hours, sent it to Joy. Then the next day, well, to be fair, you know, she takes quite a while to read scripts. <laughs> but anyway, whenever she read it, she was like, yep, this is it. And when she said, yep, this is it, I was like, oh, really? <laughs> Finally, you like it? She's like, yeah, I think this has got a lot of potential. This still takes a lot of work, but et cetera, et cetera. And then obviously fast forward to us finishing it. That, that, that hit, you know, I guess yeah, we can. I mean, we'll, we'll go back to like after, so we, we, we did the thing, we wrote some drafts, mm-hmm. gave it to like Film London for like London Calling Plus. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember calling Kobe and being like, oh, you know, we got shortlisted, yeah. yeah. And he was like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? 
Because you were, you were, you were walking. I think it was at Raheem, or you were yeah. like with somebody. I was with Charles. I was with Charles and Abby Wood. We just he literally got off the phone. and was like, hold on, Joe, hold on, hold on. And he turns to his friend. It's like I just. I was like, what? <laughs> he was gassed. I was um, gassed, man. That was actually a big day for me. I was like, goodness, and really bad things were happening for me at that time as well. They're not bad things, but like really hard to take like bit like you know when you just sort of jump into projects yeah because you really just want to keep busy and then you know kind of get blown up in my face so that was that that news that i needed to hear yeah that was like yeah so, and then we begin this process where i say to kobe right everything <laughs> you learn in film school I'm gonna oh go god <laughs> wait 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 before we even get there Jay, there's some questions i think we should leave that for the next segment no. <laughs> of the discussion because we need to we need to unpack that <laughs> well, no, I mean, I mean, I'll come back to the question because some of them don't relate to this yet. Like they relate to our next, our next section. Mm-hmm. But, um, but no, but when you, when I, when I said to you, right, I'm going to throw away what you learned in film school and I'm going to like push you forward mm-hmm. um, and I'm going to change your team and mm-hmm. <laughs> give you a whole heap of new people. Oh that was God. one of the hardest things I've ever <laughs> had to do in my life. Me and Kobe had so many I will call them disagreements. Yes, now there were arguments. Cool, let's play this, play that. We are literally on the phone with each other like, no, Joy, you don't know, I got my process. You have to leave me. She goes, no, that's film school stuff. You know, we have to go into the industry. If not in film school anymore. <laughs> Especially um, the casting director, who I love now, by the way, Isabella Dauphin is like my lifelong casting director, if you ask me, for everything that I do. Um, but it's sort of like at first, she was like, yeah, I'm gonna get a casting agent on board. I was like, no, I did auditions myself. I did auditions myself on Closure House Girl. I know what I'm doing. And Joy was like, no, Kobe. And I was like, nah, nah, Joy, I don't agree. But you know, after a while, I think that when I leave Joy, we've had an argument. Like, what she's good at is not taking things personally. So it's like she was, you know, she would just be there. Then you're like, okay, Joy, I think you're right with this thing. So let's just <laughs> there we You know what? Yeah, I mean, like this kind of ties into the question that Arnold has around how vital film school is for your development and your practice, um, what your practice was like before film school. I think, you know, in me pushing you, it wasn't the case of saying film school is not helpful. Film school teaches you the basics and gives you a foundation. Mm-hmm. Um, my thing is that, but also in film school, it teaches you everything. So you, everything. So you, so you learn to be producer and director. Sure. And at one point in time, you were a DOP as well. Oh, that even did sound. <laughs> you do everything. Yeah. I did DOP, uh, camera operated. You did, yeah. yeah. And I, and that thing of when you when you're coming into uh, in, into your own in in, in finding your voice, mm-hmm. you have to be able to let go of all that stuff mm-hmm. and to and to really focus on what it is that you want to do. Definitely. And that was the whole point of 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 haircut was of it was about you giving you a space in which there were people around you that could challenge you. Yeah. Um, and also giving you a space in which you could challenge yourself mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um and and i remember there was like on our first day of shoot i think it was charles who was like so what kobe you don't know anyone on the set you're like no. <laughs> <laughs> you know i remember that day he was like wait 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 because wait. how many people about 60 people yeah the right. thing? and then he goes wait wait kobe what you don't know anyone here i was like bro i probably know about six <laughs> this is the first you know i'm meeting the, the, these people the, for the first time you know, and et cetera. And that was an exciting revelation for me as well. I was like, oh, snap, like I'm actually like directing on a proper set, you know, yeah. which, you know, I, again, obviously credit to Joy, you know, she sort of like learned how to build systems around people and, you know, and how to diversify as well. It's not about just pushing good crew in front of people and expecting that to work. It's about obviously looking at the personality of the director and, you know, matching that with people around them that, you know, you think would work or spark. And if it doesn't, find the next best and et cetera. So I think that was a really nice process for me, very organic. But it yeah. also made me realise that I can actually work with anybody. Because, you know, yeah. you kind of get attached sometimes to the people you worked with, with your last thing, because it's kind of like, yeah, you know, they made this happen with me. But you realise that. And what, one thing by this point, making haircut and looking at closure, how else get one haircut together, I kind of realise when I remove myself from the work, I realise my style, you know, it's still there. Do you get where I'm coming from? And it's sort of like very much based on the way I see film and what interests me and the way I like to present things. So I think that, you know, that haircut was a great, number one, obviously the crew was way more experienced than, you know, I had ever worked with before. But I think that, you know, that was very testament in terms of the production value and how the story, you know, was sort of projecting. But in terms of the style and how I go about presenting it, I think that, you know, that was still the same, which I I liked, you know, I like to see that, 
and it gave me the confidence going into the next thing, knowing that, yeah, I do know what I'm doing and my style will always be there. You know, mm. to be the same people to carve out that style, you know. And I think you can definitely see the progression in your style because, you know, from closure to how, I mean, especially from house girl to haircut, you can mm. definitely see uh, how tighter haircut is in a story mm -hmm. um, and, and how the pace, the tension, everything works in a way that, you know, grips the audience. Mm -hmm. um, house girl does it, but house girl is a bit loose in, mm -hmm. in how, mm -hmm. we, how it comes together. Um, and, you know, it's that thing of watching, watching you move through all these different phases um and and still being able to tap into what makes you you know a mm -hmm. like 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 you're like the kind of filmmaker you are right mm -hmm. um so we do haircut and it does more than what either of us expected to do because oh, honestly yeah like i'm just sort of like and do you remember that day joy we went to the the film london screening yeah and it's sort of like our film was second in the, the out of nine or out of 20 you know so it's sort of like we watched it and um, what happened? It's sort of like we we obviously have watched it back and forth, and I keep asking John, like, is this a good film? Is this a good film? He's like, yeah, it's a good film. It's a good film. It's like, yeah, no, 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 it's a good film. But it's like there's things in there that I'm aware of. Yeah. Through sitting in post, I was like, oof, I hope no one notices this, notices that. So while I was watching it, I just remember thinking, oof, you know, it's like every time you see something, like ah, man, ah, you know, doing all of that, and then the first person. That indicated to me that this film was better than I realized was Olan Kaladi, the DOP. Mm. He's sitting like four seats away from me, he stretched over and held his hand out. <laughs> Kobe, that film was amazing. <laughs> I was like, whoa, really? And then we had the break after that because they showed five films break, another five break, another five break, then five, then ceremony at the end. So, like at the first break, after the first block of five, people were coming up to me and Joy, like, oh, yeah, no, haircut's really good. Duh, duh, duh. And I remember looking at Joy, like, oh, wow, this is. You know, well, there's something going on here. I'm not really, you know, I'm not really realising what's going on. But anyway, then the next film started and the next break, more people. And then I met Patrick, my agent now, you know, after the first five, he came up to me like, oh, I'm Patrick, let's have a, ch I'm from Independent Talent, let's have a chat. And then I met Max Park, who we're working with at Film 4 right now um, on some stuff, which we'll get to later if we're allowed to enjoy. But anyway, yeah. I met Max Park as well um, during those breaks. And then so like all the, the tension was sort of building up, like everyone's like an haircut. So obviously me and Joe are sort of shutting our stuff now, you know, our shoulders are getting a bit more, you know, confident. And then there was the award ceremony at the end where it's like, oh, Mike, <laughs> you know, I was, I was feeling anxious. I was thinking, well, like, you know, I'm just grateful everyone likes the film so much. And my friend Charles was always there, sort of like, oh, Kobe, you won this thing, man. You won it, you won it. I was like, come on, relax. You can't say that out loud, man. You know, you don't know if, you know, I don't want to embarrass myself. And then... It came to say, okay, well, David Yates, the Harry Potter director, selected, you know, his favourite film out of the London Calling Plus slate, et cetera, et cetera. So, and there's an award for it. And then I was just waiting. Then there was that moment where it says, and the winner is suspense. When I heard hair, it's like, I got kind of dizzy. <laughs> I got kind of dizzy and I looked at Joy and I was like, oh, no. I was like, what, haircut? No way. No, that was a, that was a life-changing moment for me, man. That, that actually felt different. Like, that's the first sort of like accolade I held in my hand and I was like, Joy, you said to do one more short film and look at this, man, you know? <laughs> you know, yeah, you know off the back of that short film, I think many things, you know, and the short film is still going, I still yeah. can't believe it sometimes, yeah. but many things and many doors opened because yeah. I think it's also about knowing when to make that move as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that thing of, if you had done that feature, you probably wouldn't be here because I think, mm -hmm. you know, Sometimes people feel like, um, like I think that you have to exercise patience. Definitely. You know, when is the right time for you to 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 make to make a next film in terms yeah. of a short film before your feature film? Because also you have time. Because I think the point of haircut was 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 a stepping stone to making films in a different kind of way. Yeah. Because features are such a big deal. Like people forget how many hours you spend. But I yeah. think I have learned that. Um, but but I, I also feel like Joy, like the the going through the short film process. I think what you really set up around me is, you know, is is just a belief in myself. You know, I think that you 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 put things in ways where I was really tested and challenged, and I had to and me sort of rising to the challenge of you know what I learned about myself. It's like oh, I didn't even know I could do that. <laughs> you know, so I'm like wow, I didn't know I knew this. 
you know what I'm saying to you? So I think that it's just, you know, it is a pleasure sort of, you know, seeing all those things and how I felt at those times, which is very uncomfortable, by the way. If there's any advice I can give to anybody, while you're growing and making decisions, it will feel uncomfortable while you're doing it, but you just have to trust your gut, you know, that that is the best thing to do. Because you don't really, especially as a director, you don't have much time to think while you're on the floor. Do you see what I'm saying to you? You kind of just have to go with your instincts and your gut and then have, you know, great people around you like Joy and, you know, heads of departments that know what they're doing to help you make your decisions along the way and, you know, just discuss it and collaborate, et cetera. Joy, should we answer some of these questions before we be on haircut? Because there's 22 now. You pick one. Yeah, let me choose a question. All right. How How does it feel to pitch... How difficult is it to pitch an urban narrative or film that has black protagonists by Faye Coker? Wow. Um, yeah, Joy, that was an interesting one. I think that, you know what? I think that, you know, to be honest with you, um, I've just realised recently that, you know, when we talk about identity, right, if you see like a black person you see a white person or you see two black people and one's Ghanaian or Nigerian. The fact is that, you know, there's certain values and customs, if you know what I mean, between the two groups that either one would never know, if you know what I mean. And I think that sometimes what I learned through the process of haircut actually was that it's not really about, I, th- I think that the beauty of cinema is being able to take your, your perspective and to take your, um, your rendition of, how you saw things happening and present it in a way that everybody can communicate with. And I think there's a way of doing that. And I think that, you know, it's psychologically tested. I, I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you know, I'm sure like people have, you know, done research on it, et cetera, on how humans respond to information. And I think that that's what the, you know, me and Joy and the script editor would constantly discuss about the story. It's not about saying, Oh, you don't understand because you're not from the culture actually the best storytellers are the ones that can tell a story and make somebody from outside the culture understand what happens in the culture by setting up certain rules, sticking to those rules. And, you know, because that's what, how, what life is. Life is a, is a group of patterns, if you know what I mean. It's a group of recurring events. And, you know, so when something doesn't happen, even though we expect it to recur, you know, it's for a reason, et cetera. So it's about, you know, looking at story in that manner. And I think that as a result, obviously working with Joy, she, you know, really really got to grips with me from script stage and you know from the edit as well and stuff you know just to make that more make my communication of my idea clearer for more people to see but I think that she's always been savvy with it because I didn't know I'm not I'm gonna be honest like I I just knew the reality and I'm sort of like no joy these notes are dumb what do these people mean I need to do this and that etc and I was really getting pissed off but joy obviously had a great way of having one foot on the industry side of things, if you know what I mean, and then having the other foot on the black side, <laughs> you know, and then I'll say something from the black side and she's like the machine that will filter through and then she'll present it to the industry the way it's meant to be said and then vice versa because then something, they might be saying something good over there that I ain't got a clue what you're talking about. So it'll go through someone like Joy who understands the language, if you know what I mean, and then present it to me the way I would understand. And I think you always need the twofold. You need somebody like that if you ask me to, you know, be that translator unless you can translate it yourself. But also it was about telling the story in a way that, you know, will communicate to anybody. Like, I don't want to make a film that only people in Ghana or the UK would watch. I want to make a film that someone in Colombia and Australia would watch and say, you know what, I can connect to this even though the, you know, the specifics aren't the same, but the core of it and the human behavior that we're sort of like exploring here you know, is something I can connect to, you know? So I think that is a long way of answering your question, Faye. You oh, I agree with you. And you know what it's that thing of every story can be universal. Yeah, every single last one. When you look at it in that sense of what is your story about? Is it, is it about love? Is it about hardship? Is it about friendship? Whatever it is, it is a universal topic that everyone can relate to. And mm-hmm. if you start from there and build your story from there and build your characters from there, mm-hmm. um, what you're pitching isn't, oh, it's an urban film. Oh, it's mm-hmm. Black protagonist. What you end up pitching is a story about love. It's a precisely, story precisely, story precisely about friendship. And I think it's about under- and it's about learning how to view things that way, mm-hmm. for people to be able to see themselves in it. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And you know, and if it's a story about love, friendship, you know, and in this love story, my character is black. That's mm-hmm. fine because mm-hmm. it's a love story. You mm-hmm. know, um, and I think yeah, I can say it's about just understanding how to present your story in a way. Exactly. 
where people can see the universality, the, the universality of it. But exactly, it. exactly, exactly. And you know what? I think that the, the, what some of the best people at that is, you know, the guy who I look up to the most, Martin Scorsese. You know, you, I, I feel like after watching Goodfellas, I understand the world of being a American Italian gangster. I have never been to Brooklyn in my entire life. You know, and, and but but while watching this film, I understand why people are making decisions. You know, I understand why he would do that because Scorsese set it up like he's built the world. He's brought me into the world. He's done it in a very. He's lured me in by laughter. You see what I'm saying to you by emotional attachment. You know, and that's the thing. If you have your own idea, which is about aliens that land in Kenya in the in the jungle, you have to set up the rules of that area and what would happen, and you have to. You know, not explain to us, but you have to set up what the dangers are. You have to set up what you know the the good things are, so you know when someone's taking a risk if they're going here. And you know, it's just it's just about you know massaging the story, and that takes time. Development takes time. It takes patience, like Joy said, to just be able to write something and being able to collaborate with people. It's not just when you're on the floor directing that is a collaborative sport. I think writing is very collaborative as well because you know being able to hear what people say that enhances your own thoughts. Is, is super key. So I think that urban films is a very damaging term, if you ask me. I think that, you know, it's, it's easy for people to bunch up stories together. But the fact of the matter is, if you know how to tell a story, and I tell a story about Woolwich, and somebody else tells a story about Woolwich, those are two different stories. You know, you know just because they're both set in Woolwich with black people don't mean it's the same film. And I think that, you know, that being able to approach your projects from that lens, you won't have to pitch an urban film, you just pitch a film. That yeah, people would, would, I mean, there are a few would, questions that you know, I kind of ask about film school. So I guess is you know, what was the benefit of film school for you? Do you think that it, it helped you grow, and yes. do you think that it helped you find an agent? You know, it, uh, did you say find an agent? One person talks about an agent, but oh, like, no, no, I don't think it helped me find an agent. I think that what film school did is it gave me a confidence to go out into the world and really, do you know what I mean, do my thing and being able to take the nose because. You know, through film school, it's like an incubator where you make mistakes, people do reject you and your ideas, you know, and then you go back and you refine it and then you get notes and then you meet people. And just like, you know, I was in there for two years and I just made films after film after film after film. So after the sixth film, where you're, you know, which is Cow's Girl, of course, but okay, the fifth film where they're giving us a bit of money with the Alexas and we're building in the studios and, you know, I'm camera operating, you know, etc. We learn ever so much. And another thing about my film school, specifically the London Film School that I love, is that, you know, you get to do everything. Like I said, I've done sound, I've camera operated, I've directed, I've written, you know, I was even going to do production design. I thought, nah, that's not, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> you know, that's, that doesn't need to happen. But, you know, you leave film school very confident. So when you work with other people, you're more confident in that field so you don't overcompensate. Like, you know, you're confident enough to know what you want and leave the professionals to go forth and work their magic. You get where I'm coming from. But if you're not savvy, sometimes you want to try and overcompensate and take over that department. And for example, with my DOPs, I was a DOP. So as you can imagine, you would expect me to, you know, oh, you know, shot by shot, tell the DOP, that's what we're getting. But my process is more organic than that. I speak now story-wise and I say, this is the story and this is why I want to present it this way. And then thereafter, a DOP has got the space to say, okay, I, based on what you've said, this is what I think. You know, and I think that film school really gives you that confidence to be able to do that, you know, and, and you know, not second guessing yourself, if you know what I mean. Sometimes, you, you know, it, it, it's just great. It's a great incubator. But I think that when you go out into the world, you have a lot of connections as well, if you know what I mean. Like people that have been there and done that, um, depending on what film school you go to as well. Like mine specifically was quite prestigious. So I sent emails with London Film School student in the subject line. So I met some really big heavyweights in this industry before I even left, you know, which was always great. So I think film school is not needed because, you know, I, I kind of mentor some people now who are doing decent. You know, they've got agents themselves, if you know what I mean, like at independent and, you know, they've made their first short, et cetera. And other people I mentioned on their scripts, they haven't been to film school. So, you know, obviously I've, you know. And I didn't go to film school. Yeah, Joy didn't go to film school. So it's one of those ones where I think that is 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 very useful because I've been through it and I think it did accelerate my trajectory in this industry by many years, I'd say, because, you know what I mean, I had that space and that guidance. Whereas if you go off on your own, you have to be, be prepared to fall down, <laughs> make mistakes yeah, and get back up, <laughs> you know? That's the thing, because, you know, on the producing side, people always say, how do you get into producing? Mm -hmm. I mean... 
it's always hard one because there's so many different kinds of producers. But for me, I just love making films. So I just ended up like in a position where um, I found, I mean, I went, I, I did like a BA in film studies, which is more about film theory. It's not really about film production, but you know, the school had some equipment. I made a couple of shorts. They weren't that great. Nobody, nobody will see them ever in life. That's okay. They were terrible. Um, and then I think a few people kind of knew that I was into filmmaking. So, you know, word of mouth, you help people out, make some films. Uh, that's, that's how I learned. I just learned by helping, working with people, making mistakes, making a lot of mistakes. Um, there was once where I, you know, and also most of the money I used to make films were all, all kind of like my own cash. I would save up money and then I would just go to rental houses and just be like, oh, I've only got like 500 pounds. What can you get me? And if you're just like honest and nice to people, they'll usually give you stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, whatever they can give you anyway. Uh, and there was once that I made a short film. I wrote it. Somebody else directed it. I produced it. Um, and then a week later, I went to the DOP. Oh, where's the hard drive? <laughs> and he told me that he had filmed over all the footage. Oh, God. <laughs> From that day forward, I have two, three backups. Of yeah. Yeah. Joy is always like, no, we need three copies. I'm like, Joy, it's all right, okay? It's never going to happen again. <laughs> that has traumatized me. I am, I am carrying backups with me for days. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like, that is how I learn. I learn by just doing stuff, making mistakes. Um, but at the same time, I met some amazing people. You know, that's how I met Marco um, and a few other people, people along the journey because I think the thing about uh, making films is that you have to be in it for the long run. Definitely. Because there will definitely be times where you will fall over and there will definitely be times where um, shoots will not happen. I've had a shoot like day two, we went to go shoot at this location because I got my friend to be location manager. My friend who, who knows nothing about film is my We've we, we all done that, Joy. We've all done that. So we get there and she's like, no, no, the guy's inside. The guy's definitely inside. We're calling, calling, calling. An hour goes by. My man's nowhere to be found. <laughs> we couldn't get to the location oh, God. anywhere else so I had to call the shoot off which meant like I, like I wasn't shot for a day I couldn't afford to shoot anymore and the actors were all just irritated and annoyed by this point <laughs> and, you know again that's like money down the drain but yeah, they're all lessons that I've learned yeah. um, along the way and I have so many more stories of how things have gone wrong um, but you know what yeah, I always say you need to learn that stuff when you're starting out yes and okay. when the risk is like less tv feature film then you know better so no one should know better you do better so i think making shorts is the best time to make mistakes Definitely. And it doesn't matter what mistakes you're making because they're not actually mistakes you're just learning you know i, I, I think joy i'm, I'm going to share what you said with me because it's like there's something that joy said to me very early on which actually still carries me through today and it's very much a part of my confidence is when i was making house when well, we finished shooting house girl and we got back to London and I was just depressed you know it was just because it was just you know it was a, it was quite messy you know Joy, Joy did her best and the team did their best to sort of keep it but it's impossible to keep something like that contained because it's sort of like there's you know sort of costs that come out from everywhere then you know every you know all sorts of things happen so I remember thinking oh man this is stressful I'm still working full time you know um I, I owe people money I took a leap of faith, you know, did this really pay off? And Joy said one thing to me one time, which kind of stuck with me. She was kind of like, you know what, I promise you, but this year it would have blown over. Like, honestly, you can stress as much as you want now, but by this time next year, I promise you, you're not going to care about, about anything you're, 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 you're feeling now. I don't know how that's going to happen, but I can promise you, like, and she, you know, that confidence in her voice saying that this is going to blow over, I sort of like started to lean on that because I had no choice. Mm -hmm. And then there was a point when, I realized that, wait, what Joy said was true. And I called her, I was like, oh, do you remember when you said, just, you know, just, and after the thing about film, film is a risk, is a risky business. That's why a lot of people are risk averse in this business. That's, that's why, you know, some people may not give an opportunity to no one, to, to people with nothing on paper, because, you know, there's a lot of money involved, if you know what I mean. So it's just good to be able to have a mentality from early when the risk is low to just pull your way through problems. And that's something that Joy is great at, I think. She's always a calming presence on every project, if you know what I mean, whereas like people will be sort of like panicking and now we need to do this. But then you speak to Joy and she's like, oh, Kobe, don't worry about it. We'll say, and sometimes like Joy, 
honestly, if this house burns, I'm blaming you. <laughs> but yeah, I think that calm approach and that mentality, that mental part of, you know, making mistakes, you have to own it. Like if it happens, it's not the end of the world. You're going to make more films. If it is a, a, a if it's a, let's say worst case scenario, the film doesn't happen. The fact is you're going to learn something from that. That's going to make you one of the best around. And you have to sort of look at these instances as positive lessons as opposed to are oh, lost out there's no point in in falling out with people there's no point in you know insulting people and spreading rumors and talking about that experience the best way for you to proceed from those things is to just be positive and 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 just to be calm because the fact is you can't do anything anyway do you know what i mean it's not like panicking fixes it and i think learning that from joy was just a a, a pleasure for me because i, I took that into obviously the biggest stage and you know it rung true you know sort of like re- hearing joy's voice next stage in your career but i really want to answer yeah. something that matthew prince was asking about yeah. um finding people i think when you're starting out um i think just go on to things like um on facebook you've got a lot of like film groups you know like um that you can definitely join to just meet people there are a lot of different networking events like bfi network also have their own events as well depending mm-hmm. on where you are and mm-hmm. i think when you when you're trying to meet other film people go to spaces that they are and you can find those spaces on google um film 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 meetup whatever it is and just go and meet different people there Mm -hmm. and i think that's how you're going to actually find more people and sometimes it's not about going on special courses sometimes it's just about talking to people getting on sets and watching people like for me i learned about budgets by just watching other people do budgets I learned how to make a, I learned about a feature film budget by watching a line producer do one. I didn't go to school to learn that stuff. Most of the things I did, I've done, I haven't gone to school to learn it. I just watch people and I ask questions and I learn. And that's kind of, there are different ways of learning. And so you, you shouldn't let accessibility um, through mainstream ways stop you from doing things because the internet has so much information. But you can, I mean, Sundance Lab, I think, um, their master classes, a few of them are currently free. So if you go on there now, you can, there's a wealth of information just waiting for you. Um, and then moving on to... Well, the, should we move on? Should, should we move forward here? from haircut? To nuts and crosses. Let's talk. Uh, come on, let's talk. Okay, let's, let's go to nuts and crosses. I was going to say, let's talk about that little project before. <laughs> start, start naming people and, and shame, name and shame. No, I'm joking. Um, I think... The thing about it for most people is seeing you go from haircut to knots and crosses. What was, you know, that leap like, but also what did you learn and realize you had, and what were your challenges in that? You know what, can I be honest with you? I think that, you know, for me, again, through haircut, very early on, I learned that, you know, filmmaking is filmmaking. I think that I, w- I, I was never going to turn down that job because I always knew I could do it. Like, you know, before that, I remember I emailed the top wear execs while I was, you know, in the rough cut of haircut. And I was like, look, you know, this is my rough cut. I definitely think I could do top wear. Like, I was ready for that to come, if you know what I mean. I was rubbing my hands. So when it did come and Noughts and Crosses landed on my lap, like, I was really raring to go. Like, like I didn't think of being as- afraid of it. I think with things like that, you can't think of any mistakes. You have to just go. You have to, you know, just, you know, they wouldn't have called you if, you know, they didn't think you could do the job, if you know what I mean. And I doubt they gave me the job based on just haircut alone. I'm sure they saw House Girl, you know, and saw that I went to film school and et cetera and done other things to offer that job, you know. And I think that when I went there, I was just confident again. Like, if you want me to be honest, like, shooting House Girl was much harder than working on Noughts and Crosses. Let me be honest, like, shooting House Girl was, was... more taxing on my men- on my mental, more taxing spiritually, is more taxing physically, and I think that you know, Noughts and Crosses is a bigger machine. But you know, with the with the with the bigger with the more work that comes, the personnel and the tools are there too. If you know what I mean, and it's not about overexerting yourself as well. It's about having being confident enough to delegate and to collaborate and to set the vision and to be able to be of service to people. You know, and I think that that has allowed me to learn that further from haircut, you know, and I think that I always say that short film is like driving an Astra and working on a feature or working on a, a, a big TV show is like driving a Range Rover. Do you see what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, it's still the same thing. You still have to, you know, maybe guess what? You don't have a clutch on the Range Rover. So, <laughs> you know, you don't have to worry about that. It's, a, it's an automatic. And then, you know, you've got, you know, a big 
seat in the I don't know if anyone here is driven the Range Rover, but do you know what I mean? Like it's sort of like it's like a couch, you know, and you got all these buttons that you need, you know, and it's all about luxury. But you know, in order to do a job like that and to operate a machine like that, you, there are some luxuries that has to come with, you know, some things that make like an assistant and people that do your schedule and, you know, and, and, and put your meeting. So you, you make sure you cover everything. Like I've had the chat about costume. I've had the chat about this. I've had a chat about that. And I think, you know, the producer on that actually, Johan Noble was phenomenal. He used to be in the army. So with him, everything's literally like a, army operation you know mm -hmm. everything's very timely you know and and he's he's just someone i learned from massively you know massive massively he's he, you know he's a big guy anyway in size but you know in terms of what he's achieved as well you know he's i, I believe he's been BAFTA nominated for shameless and all sorts so it's sort of like you know story-wise as well like joy so i've always been blessed with working with producers who are very savvy story-wise you know and and i can have that conversation with them so my vision can be supported by them, if you know what I mean. If, if I'm not able to communicate this vision in a certain way, they're always there to spread that, you know, to those people in the industry way, if you know what I mean. And I think, yeah, Noughts and Crosses was great, man. I worked with great people. You know, I really loved everybody I worked with on that project. No, no one, you know, excluded from that list. You know, I think that there was a lot of challenges. What was the difference in terms of directing for film and directing for TV? Mm -hmm. um, when you when you got into TV, what did you realize? Like, okay, I can't do A, B, C, D like sure. that. I think that is more of a team effort, and I think actually filmmaking should be a team effort, full stop. And I think that in, I could take some TV aspects into film, which would be very useful. But you know, with film, the decisions really do lay on the director's shoulders. If you know what I mean, they, they is mainly on the director's shoulders, and everyone around is supporting the director. And propping up his shoulders do you get where i'm coming from because they obviously want it to be as good as he wants it to or she wants it to be you know so you know i think that film the onus is on the directors you know post you know i see it like this you know you could be a lot more creative and artistic with it but i think in tv you'll find that it's very much heavy on producers and writers as well i think the executive producers are very key players in that field and rightly so i've learned rightly so they know what they're talking about story-wise Sometimes it's not always about story, it's about, look, <laughs> people need to watch this in the first 10 minutes, so let's shift yeah, this yeah. scene, <laughs> you see what I'm saying, see, over here, just to make sure we keep, you know, the attention, and then this can happen at this point. And I think there's this beautiful merger of that, sort of merging the statistics with story, which kind of feels good, you know, and it kind of, you know, and, and with me, I, I want to be very visual, and if you want me to be honest with you, I was very ambitious with my shots. Me and my technical team had a whale of a time but a lot of that was sort of butchered, <laughs> you know, which is fine. Not a lot. I'd say, let's call it 50-50. A lot of, you know, because I'm a visual storyteller. Like if, I, if, if there's ever a camera move or I'm going right into someone's face or it comes across more artistic than just the average coverage, if you know what I mean, is always for a reason. And I guess for me, I just took it as if I'm able to sell my vision to the execs and they accept it, then that is, that is a good earned place, if you know what I mean. And a lot of it did. But if it is the case they don't get it, then I'm not going to be that guy in the room where it's like, nah, it has to be this way because I'm the director, you know? But I do know that when I start to make TV shows where I'm the showrunner and I'm the exec as well, like, I feel like I'm going to have a lot more say in that room, if you know what I mean. I think that, you know, I'm going to be able to present my ideas a lot clearer, if you know what I mean. Because I think sometimes, you know, you, you just need a bit more not power, but you need a bit more scope, a bit more space to, to push it that bit further for people to see, if you know what I mean. So, but yeah, the Notes and Crosses was life-changing for me. I loved it. I had the time. I learned a lot. You know, I collaborated with great people and I'm really proud of the work. You know, when I watch it, I honestly get goosebumps when I see the performances of those phenomenal actors and, you know, then the, the visual storytelling to support it. I have to say I'm very proud of that too. So, yeah. I'm going to ask a question from Yasmin Ali because I think it sort of relates to going from, you know, going, going to work and not so crosses. Like, have you ever dealt with imposter syndrome? If so, Defo, man. how have you overcome it? Of course, man. Imposter syndrome just comes with it. I was 28 when I was <laughs> offered that job, you know. I was a 28-year-old guy. I just left ENDS maybe like three, four years before that. You know, and, you know, sometimes when I speak, you know, ENDS kind of still comes out, <laughs> which is not a bad thing. It is me. I don't, I'm not ashamed. You know, mate. Yeah, I speak and joy, I don't really speak you know, sort of clean English. So like, yo, brother, man, where's it? hurry up and read the flipping script, man. <laughs> you know, but it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's sort of like being myself. And, you know, when you go into a space, and I think film school helped a lot because I was kind of like the only person there as well. So I already was experiencing the imposter syndrome in film school, 
which I got to grips with very early and I became very unapologetic about it. I was wearing my tracksuits every day. One guy would ask me one day, like, why are you always wearing tracksuits and trainers? And I was like, mate, why are you always wearing leather shoes, bro? Like, <laughs> that's the way, that's the weirdest thing ever. But, you know, it was about just putting myself in a different space and celebrating myself and not, not trying to conform to what people think I should look like if I'm a director. And I think that it was just refreshing for everybody in Cape Town. I was actually, I got on everybody from cast to crew, you know, and I think that that imposter syndrome shortly vanished because people started not dancing to my tune, but they started to see the workflow I was setting up and it was favorable for everybody. You know, yeah. it's an open floor. Anyone can speak to me. Just obviously we know, we know a set etiquette. We know who you speak to at which time for what, but if it is the case that the hunters, the costume guy is not about, right? Lauren, the costume standby can speak to me. We have jokes, you know, we go and have, you know, drinks while they're smoking and the, having their cigarettes in the back. I'm just standing around. I stand with the guys that make the slush puppies and we, but you know, we, we crack jokes and have our banter, but then it makes everybody want to come to work and it becomes a lot more fun. Do you know where I'm coming from? So, yeah. That's such an important thing to, to do because I think even for me, like I definitely suffer from imposter syndrome. Um, I think when, when I got into Blue Story, um, and they were like, okay, it's Paramount and BBC Films and yeah. <laughs> the budget is 1.3. You know, you, like, you've got to sit there for, for, a minute, for a minute yet because prior to doing Blue Story, I'd only done, I'd done like two no budget feature films. Like when I say no budget, these films had like 35K shooting mm. budget, yeah. Um, and I was actually developing a, a different debut feature for like about a million pounds. So I was like, okay, I had this mentorship with Ben, which was meant to get me to a place where I will start to be producing films at least a million pounds. So it did come at the right time. But I think when when they say, oh, it's BBC Films and Paramount, it's like, like whoa, we. <laughs> <laughs> and it was that thing of like, you've got to deliver a studio film on an indie film budget. Yeah. Um, there's already pressure on that. And the the thing about it that I think um, that I kind of got through was, was by especially like that you were saying about house sales and how stuff like that really taught us just like we can do anything at this point literally after house girls literally you can act, you actually feel like you're flying man you could do anything so like so for me like i just approached the film as if i would approach any other film i think that's the same thing where like you have to go to you have to go to set as if it was any other day and it was any other production because mm. i think if you let the gravity of everything around you get to you. It You're just it shrinks you a little bit. Mm -hmm. so you have to approach it like, you know what, yeah, you lot are like me, innit? Like mm -hmm. your people, you're here to work, I'm here to work. And also remembering why you're there and who you, and who you are there and your position there as well. Um, so I think there were some days on Blue Story where in my mind, like, especially if it was a bad day, I'd be like, what am I doing? I'm not. I'm not equipped to be doing this. And then I remember actually like these people have put here because they think you can do it. Mm -hmm. So who are you to say you can't do it? Precisely. It's actually, it's actually quite insulting to the people who have not rolled the dice on you, but invested in you. They're putting a lot of money behind you. And I think that it's just actually just respectful to say, well, I actually respect those people's decision for me to come and do a good job. And the fact is, Joy knows she, Joy knows she knows what she's doing. She's just silly sometimes. Just has to just say, Joy, stop, stop pissing around. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you definitely know what you're doing. And I, I think that the, the beautiful part about that is that even though you know what you're doing, you're always growing, especially when you allow yourself to grow, especially when you allow yourself to say, you know what, I don't know. What do you, what do you think? Cool. You know? And I think that that's the most confident people. If you don't know, don't talk. Like when you don't know and you talk confidently, Right, we, we, you know, without listening to anybody else's ideas, you know what I mean. You're sort of shooting yourself in the foot. I'm not saying don't, if you don't know, don't think. Of course, think, but have other people else around you. This is what I'm saying to you. You can talk to you because then that's, you know, when you have imposter syndrome, sometimes you overcompensate, and I think that is that's the bad thing. You know, when you feel like you have to start, you know, performing and looking like you know what you're doing. You know, sometimes it's about saying this is my idea. What do you think? You know. I mean, I think that, that sort of leads us into uh, Zaheer Raj's question around. Did you feel ready? Did you feel ready to direct television? Yeah, listen, I was ready for anything. Trust me. If you slap me thirty mil to do a feature, I'm getting ready and rubbing my hands. Like, you see me? I've been that guy. Like again, I come from ends. I've been in situations no one can ever imagine. <laughs> I have to be honest with you. And you know, you just have to be ready at the end of the day. You know, some 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 of those scenarios I sort of walked into them myself. Others, 
you know what I'm saying to you, it kind of came my way. But I think from my, my upbringing and what I've been through, it's kind of, I'm, I'm on my toes by default. Like, I'm, and especially when I'm anticipating what I want to do, right? And there's a conversation I was already having with my agent. So when I signed with them, they're like, so what do you want to do in TV? I was like, Black Mirror, don't want to talk about it anymore. There's nothing else. I want to do high-end drama, Black Mirror. I love it. Love every department of Black Mirror. Bam. They're like, yeah, that's high-end drama. Rare, rare. That may take you a couple of years. This is in 2018, by the way. He's like, oh, this may take you about four or five years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and which is the way the industry goes at the time, you know, it's based on research and what's happened before. But by God's grace, you know, when it came, I was ready because I expected it. I was just like, I was like, you see, you're saying five years, this can happen for me tomorrow, the way, the way my God works. You know what I'm saying? So, you know what I mean? I was just like, let's get this. And then when I started shadowing on Top Boy, that was great. I was sort of learning, you know, and being on a big set, you know, with loads of equipment of loads of people and seeing how the directors, like I was shadowing, I wasn't running. So I was basically like just there. You know, a lot of the time I just leave when we're shooting in a, a cramped apartment, you know, like for Jamie's house and stuff. But, you know, I just I was just there and it was great to see. So when I got the notes and crossed the job, I was like, OK, so now I'm going to have to do what Brady's been doing. <laughs> and I can, I can actually do it. If you want me to be honest with you, as I was looking at the top boy thing in my head, I was like, come on, I could do this. <laughs> oh, my God, there's a question here from me if I may mispronounce the name, Eileen Lee. Like, how did you work with the other directors and Lux and Crosses? Like, did you guys work closely together? Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't say closely, but we did have conversations, which is great. I think that, you know, Julian Holmes is a really great director. He's someone who is very confident with his visual style, if you know what I mean. And, and he, you know, we all discuss telling the story from the inside out, you know, telling an internal story and, you know, it being very reactive. So you see the reactions before you see what they're reacting to you know, etc. And he's got his way of doing that. But we had a conversation with him, he's DLP, the producer, Johan, and me and my DLP, and to talk about continuity of the show so that it all identifies as one show, which is very key and very important. But I think the producer has a big role to play in that as well, if you know what I mean, in terms of downloading all the information from First Block and, you know, being part of the, the creative discussion with me and my DLP over what ideas we have that works been you know the the house style if you know but there wasn't really a house style if you want me to be honest with you because the the reality of noughts and crosses is that we were just all great filmmakers just making this film as we go and we're identifying the bits that start to form the style and leaving that there and identifying other bits that don't really work until it starts to work and then leaving that there so it's like a building process and building the style and I think we've established that now um, in a good way but I think working with the first director I mean he was really when he was doing his thing I wasn't really about I just used to come on set like I was shadowing on Top Boy again and just watch him work which was great he was always really nice to me came and said you know explained to me what he was doing when I asked he never got arsy with me when I asked questions you know which was great you know and I think that Julian was there for me big time mm-hmm. um, but yeah I think that when it got to my episodes honestly I, you, I mean when you watch the series you can, you can see the difference in styles between us two directors um, and I was just left in, and, and Mammoth did great. They just left me to just do my thing, which was, you know, really encouraging. Um, but, yeah, I wouldn't say I worked to, to, to simplify the answer. I wouldn't say I, you know, worked day in day out with the Block One director, but we had discussions. And when I was shooting some, you know, doing some pickups for him, you know, we'll have phone calls, so where he tells me what he's trying to achieve, and then I'll just go and try and do my best with that. If you know what I mean. Yeah, and I think this is like a good way to lead in because there's a question here about um, from Nora about talking about the process of raising funds for a feature film, specifically its first feature, which leads us to Haircut the Feature. After also cross, yeah, wait, 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 before we get there, so we didn't really touch on Blue Story. So, Joy, how did you feel about um, producing the highest grossing <laughs> urban film in UK history? How, how did it feel to... to to hold the the weight of such an achievement? And and how did you go about placing the project, and not just in terms of the back end, in terms of packaging the project with Ratman in a way that could sit on on that on that um, you know, I mean, to be honest with you, so like Damien Jones, um, who's the other producer on Blue Story, he actually got in touch with me and was like, I'm working on this thing with Ratman. He's just done Shire Story 1 and 2, 3 is about to come out, here's the script, read it. Um, and let me know what you think. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, and this all happened because Damien is a man who, is, who doesn't like to wait around. 
So this all happened within the space of a few days where he called me, he sent me the script. Let's say, let's say on Thursday, I got the phone call. On Friday, I had the script. On Tuesday, I met Damien. And I, as soon as I said yes, Damien had already typed out emails with my name attached to produce and he was just going, oh, you know here? love it <laughs> he just sort of email it everyone because <laughs> um, i think him it was like you're doing it obviously like what's wrong with you and i remember sitting with damien um when, just before we had our bbc films meeting and i was just asking him questions because damien you know he's done bell he's done adulthood i and lady so he's done it all right and i remember asking him just about like his career and whatnot i remember like he said to me like the point of you making this film with me right now is that after you've made this film, you will never have to find a person like me to make a film with because you would know everyone. Um, and I was like, oh, okay. So this is like my next step in like, I don't know, the things I have to learn. I'm in the boss. <laughs> the beautiful thing about David was that he, you know, in terms of the way he, he let me come in and create. So I could pick the team that I wanted to work with. And it's that thing we spoke about of um, finding the right people who get along and the right people who can make the work, mm. you know, bang. Mm. At the end of the day, for me, you know, what, what, what Rax was trying to do, um, it was also about finding people who could support him because he's going from doing essentially like, you know, guerrilla filmmaking, on road, doing whatever, to then doing a structured film, but like huge budget, and all these different people. And mm -hmm. it was trying to find the right selections of people and also the right environment to create that, which mm -hmm. I think, honestly, for me, half of producing is just understanding people and people mm -hmm. management and, mm -hmm. and, and bringing people together to gel. And also the beautiful thing about the crew is that everyone understood that it was gonna be hard, but we were, we were doing something beautiful. And raps mm. every other day would be like, come on guys, we're making history. And then when you're like, it's a hard day, I don't want to hear that in it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it is true what he was saying. Manifestation. Um, <laughs> and at the end of that process, you know, it was such a mad one because halfway through the shoot, we had to move location in it because we couldn't shoot in South no more. Uh, and I could just see the money signs going from the budget. Cause I was like, we're meant to be shooting in South London, but suddenly we're, we're North. Um, but when we came, when we were making plans of how we were going to market the film, I think, you know, and kudos to Paramount and BBC, we were all quite conscious of the messaging of the film and what we were trying to do. And also Raps himself, you know, in, the, in, in what he was doing, he was conscious of his message, which is about anti, around anti-violence. He was like, you know, he only wanted to see one scene that had blood because he wanted that to have an impact on people. But in all in all, we're all kind of, this is a film about telling people to put their guns down, their knives down. So in all the marketing and press material, yes, on some level, you had the idea of the, oh my God, it's a gang film. But actually, when you watch the film, it's not. Like the, I think when people went to go watch it, they were actually kind of shocked about how emotional they mm. were. Mm -hmm. Like, they would laugh, they would cry, all these different things. Um, and they were really invested in Timmy and Leah. Um, mm. And... You know, when you're making a film, you think, yeah, yeah, it's good. But it's a different experience when you're in the room and people are reacting in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, and then the whole thing with View Cinema happened, which you don't talk about. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but that really helped us because all that did for us was that people were then interested to know what the hell is this Blue Story film about? <laughs> and it was great because on Twitter, I would see a lot of um, people um, who were not the ideal demographic, quote unquote, in terms of like, they were older, um, usually white men, who were like, oh, this film is amazing, this was great. And suddenly you, you branch out of what people expect you to, the, the audience they expect you to be seeing. So I don't know, Blue Story was like a, was like a whirlwind, whirlwind experience. It was a, one of those films that um, it did a lot of, and it's still doing a lot of craziness. Mm -hmm. I think especially in isolation because people are just buying the DVD now and watching mm -hmm. the VOD. Yeah. Well, that's great, man. Congratulations on that achievement. It's, it's you know, you did, you did a great job. But yes, I guess that now leads us to the, the full circle moment of when we came back together to begin working. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, we came back to do Heck. Actually, no, we, we were actually going to do a different feature film. 
Yes. Did, did it particularly work out? Yes. For many, for, for many valid reasons. Numerous reasons. <laughs> most, most screaming and shouting with me and Joy, which is great. <laughs> I think, well, I should say the, the thing about director-producer relationships is that you have to be able to have conversations with exactly. each other. Yeah, um, and still remember it's all about work. That's it. You have to be, uh, look. The reason why it works with me and Joy is we have difficult convos, and you know, no matter no matter what emotions comes in and out of 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 that, you know, that that discussion. One thing I like about me and Joy again is that the mutual respect is there as filmmakers, number one. But on a personal level, she's actually my friend, which I think that you know is not always needed with that partnership. Don't get me wrong, but I think that when you do have a friend that you can collaborate with, you have an extra layer of, do you know what I mean? It's sort of like we can make this happen. And I think that that's something that, you know, I, I, I do appreciate a lot. But so we've decided to do haircut, you know, yeah. obviously, which kind of feels like the natural progression from making the short film to go and do the feature. And I, I think, think that, that yeah. I, mean, it, it, I guess we can talk about the process of, of the money, but also we can talk about um, where you're currently at as well in your process. Because I think, you know, money wise, raising funds for a feature for me, it just depends on it depends on your package, I guess, because I think, you know, obviously for Kobe, he's coming from make, wanting to make Haircut into a feature film and Haircut's already done what he's done as a short. So mm. you kind of take that to different funding bodies, be it BFI, Film4, BBC Films, whoever it is, um, and you go for some development money. Or if you've, if, you've, if you've already got some money, or sorry, if you've already like, you know, written your feature film script, it's then about figuring out, um, who, like, how you're going to package it and what it's about, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and understanding what I think I think you have to know who you're going to, because yeah. not every film is for everyone. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, a film at Film Four might not be a film to go to BBC Films. It just depends. I mean, but I think that's just more about you learning about the industry yeah. and knowing and knowing specifically who's looking for what. But I think with film four, with film four, especially because Max Park had met Kobe, yes, um, ages ago. Anyway, it yeah. kind of made sense for that relationship. It was very organic. It was very organic. I, th I think that you know, me and Joy both agreed it was a very safe space to go uh, go and make a film. If you know what I mean, that that extra support, which you know, is always going to be great when it's like I grew up watching Steve McQueen and his relationship with film four. If you know what I mean, and it always meant a lot to me. So I think, you know, being able to be in that room and, you know, the, the love that we were shown when we, like, me and Joy go in for those meetings and there's such respect at that table, which feels good, you know what I mean? It's not about people saying that we're going to, we're better than you. It's about people saying we really want to be a part of you guys' journey and you guys' partnership and you guys as individuals. So I think that, yeah, haircut just made sense. And I think we've just been writing ever since. I mean, I've been dragging my feet a little bit. I'll put my hands up. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> because Joy was sweating me at first, but she's kind of taken the foot off the gas a little bit, which which, which I do appreciate because lockdown's not easy. But I think that, you know, I've done the first draft of the script, wrote 111 pages and sent that to Joy and script editors or script editor, Angeli McFarlane, the great, and got some phenomenal notes. So I think now we're at a stage where it's about me doing that revision of the um, first draft and then us sending it to film four. But, you know, me personally, I just see it as I can't wait to get this made because it's, it's going to be the result of everything I've been through thus far from Notes and Crosses to Haircut, the short, to, you know, everything that's happened to me personally, the things that I've watched since, the things that I've learned since. And I'm going to have better crew to work with, you know, the people that worked in the Notes and Crosses, like, for example, the production designer, you know, is a Shane Bunce, phenomenal guy. He's worked on Queen of Cartway. He's went, worked on Avengers, Age of Ultron, some Black Mirror episodes, you know, the DOPs. I've got an array of people I can work with from the guy who shot the short film. He's a phenomenal DOP to Julio Baikari. He's been doing this 30 years, you know, so it's like, you know, and Joy's obviously said, oh, I think it would be good to build the barbershop this time. I was like, oh my God, yes, it would, <laughs> you know? So those conversations are now starting to happen, which is exciting. I think that, you know, is really going to enhance our idea from the short into something a lot more, with a lot more space, if you know what I mean, to tell a better story, you know, that feels good. And I've decided to tell it over the course of 24 hours, just to maintain that contained feel to the film, that community driven contained sort of aura that we, 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 we aim for with the short film. So yeah, that's what we are at right now. Um, and it's going to be a beautiful journey. Yes. Um, we've got 15 minutes left. So I'm going to yes. answer a few questions. 
Yes. This one is from Salom. He said, hey guys, I'm very young, 70 year old filmmaker. And it's, oh, there's a go. 70 year old filmmaker, early in my career. He did speak to me last week um, and he, about, about a film that he's working on. And he wanted to know what steps he can take to find his own creative style for his upcoming projects. He wants to tell stories about Ghana and his culture, but he doesn't know how to make his something that audiences have already seen. Where can he go next in his career? So Toby, how can he find his voice? By just making films and by being unapologetic about certain things while you first start out and while you're you know, sort of like expressing yourself is about just making mistakes and learning from them yourself. But essentially, you know, you know what you like. What you like is usually very instinctive. I think what makes it quite, um, what's the word? What makes it quite blurry sometimes is when you second guess yourself and you doubt yourself and then you sort of realize, oh, I don't know what my style is. But the fact is, yes, you do. You do know what your style is. You just need to make films, which gives you more and more confidence to just allow yourself to be yourself if you know what I mean and you will do that I think sometimes you will make decisions to not listen to yourself and then learn that you should have and then other times you'll do the direct opposite but by doing that a couple of times you'll just realize that hey actually you know this works for me it might not work for anybody else but for me it does so yeah just make films you know build teams you know be unapologetic about what you're doing you know and, and keep the train moving yourself you know like if you're not moving forward don't expect anybody else to push you forward you know when you move forward everybody moves with you so just make stuff you know and as you're starting to make stuff people will come and join you know people who else who are also moving will come and join your team you don't want like if you stay still you get other people who are staying still it just it kind of works that way and you know you just don't move forward you both stay still together but if you're both moving forward then you know in that forward trajectory you sort of align in the middle then you know you're building teams that you could probably work with for the rest of your life like I, me and joy have and all the films we've made, we've used the same composer on, what, three? Yeah. yeah you know, so three of those. And I have actually worked with him um, in, on Closure as well that I didn't make with Joy. So it's sort of like I've got that partnership as well as Joy, you know, that is recurring. But I've worked with a different DOP on every film, if you know what I mean. So it's just about just do and move forward and let things happen. And once you go forward, you're always going to do well, you know, and you know, when you allow yourself to learn and when you allow yourself to do and just don't be hard-headed, man. Just don't. There's a myth that directors are supposed to be these arrogant guys who don't believe in anybody else's thoughts but their own. And I think that that's actually a big lie. I think, well, not a big lie. In my opinion, I'm enhanced by the great people around me. You know, they listen to what I have to say, make it better. And I, I accept it when it works. And um, when speaking of music, Ashley Francis Roy has a question. How do you work with music in your films? Mm -hmm. How do I work with music? You know, music is a very wonderful part of filmmaking. For me personally, I love music by itself and I know how music makes me feel. And I think that um, images and sound, when they come together, do well to create reactions. And with me, I write scripts in my, uh, I, write, I write my scripts thinking of feelings per scene, if you know what I mean. So a lot of the time when I'm writing a scene, I think of a song that makes me feel the way I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to achieve here, if you know what I mean. And I, and I have that song in my head while I'm writing and it kind of allows me to, you know, write tonally what I want to write, if you know what I mean. Whether it's supposed to be sad, whether it's supposed to be anxious, whether it's a thriller aspect and, you know, and I listen to drill music myself, you know, like I listen to rap music, you know, but I also listen to the classical music and I listen to a variety of things. And I think that, you know, music for me is usually the like emotional heartbeat of a film do you get where i'm coming from like a, not obviously that's already in the story but actually it's not the emotional heartbeat it's like the it's, it's like it's, it's like a representation of the heartbeat if you know what i mean it's like it, it 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 exposes the heartbeat even more so you can feel it if you know what i mean and i think that music just does a lot for me in films and i think that being able to differentiate between the composer who writes original scores and cues you know which sometimes you don't even know if it's a sound or music, if you know what I mean. It's just something you hear which guides you along with the story, but also like sync, you know, and have, go into music, actual songs that you have in popular culture, which will drive the story forward. But I think they both have their uses, you know, and I think it's about going again and sticking with feeling, you know, and I think it adds a lot of texture to your film. You know, it's not like when you watch a film, it's not just about what you see, it's about what you hear as well, because film is 50% sound. So I think that, 
actually in sound, 50% of that again is music, if you ask me, because it's very, very important. I always forget how important sound is sometimes. Yeah. In um, Owen's got, Owen Aspel's got a question. Yeah. How, um, how do you find that producer director partnership that works so well and where the voice is really shared? Hmm. Again, I think it's just about working with people, you know, that, you know, you, you, you give them ben the benefit of the doubt when you start. Don't go in thinking someone's the worst person, otherwise you're wasting your time. And I think that as you go, you start to realise the things that you like and don't like, and then you weigh them up. You know, there's things that you can live with. There's things that you can't live with. You know, I can get very emotional sometimes because I, I can go as far as say, oh, I'm never working with this person again. Do you get where I'm coming from? But, you know, after some time of reflection, realised that, oh, actually, <laughs> you know, the, that, what, you know what I mean? I was just being emotional so it's just about allowing yourself to go through those processes and just be just let it be organic you know your stuff like if you know something and you want to put your foot down and you don't believe you should not put your foot down then do it and if the other person believes you should put your foot down then they'll stay if they don't then they'll go and that's just how it works i think that when people are open and transparent about what they want and how they want to work and you know some people compromise choose what they want to compromise on and other and what they don't want to compromise on by that being that transparent and, and, you know, all aiming for the same goal, you kind of do, you know, it's inevitable. You find the people that you work with for life and people that you just don't want to work with, you know, yeah. and I, I've been there before, you know, I've, and some people I don't work with anymore. And sometimes like, you know, whenever I meet directors who want to work with me or, pe or people who want to work with me, um, I mean, my usually thing is like, I'll read a synopsis if I like it, then I'll meet the person, not, not, not to talk about the work, but just to meet them to see if we even get on. Because mm. the director relationship is, you know, it's a marriage. It's like, you know, we are, we are together. We will spend the next three to five years of our lives together mm -hmm. on a feature film. So we have to get on. So I feel like I always kind of prioritize, do I like you? But again, I'm not a fool. If Brad Pitt is like, Joy, do you want to work in a film? Mm. I'm going to be like, of course, yeah, I'll work in the film with you. Like, at the end of the day, that's, that's just kind of like the way it is sometimes. But I think you have to be very... Um, open to 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 knowing a person mm -hmm. in the grand scheme of things. Um, Jade Newington Gardner has a question: What motivated you to keep going when things were challenging for you? Say that again. What motivated you to keep going when things were challenging for you? Well, Joy knows the answer to this, and I, <laughs> you know, uh, mine mine is God. You know, I'm, you know, Jesus Christ is, is 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 has saved me time and time and time again. You know, there's times when, you know, I haven't known when to turn and I pray and I just leave it in God's hands. And what I mean by that is I literally just don't stress anymore. Like I just, you know, I've, and it takes practice to get to that place where you just trust in God. Because, you know, sometimes not everyone is going to sort of latch on to the way I think or my beliefs in Christ, if you know what I mean. But it works for me. And actually, you know, it, it works for more than just me. But, you know, some people may say, hey, no, it doesn't. That's not how it works for me, which is fine. But for me, it's sort of like the worst positions I've been in, even if somebody comes as a resource or if someone comes and says, hey, actually, did it gives you some advice that helps. That comes after I pray, if you know what I mean. And I, so I, my, my sort of thing is every time I, I'm in a hard place, I tap into the source. And the source for me is God. It's like putting a plug into a socket. That socket is where the electricity comes out of. So every time I need guidance, every time I feel lost, every time I feel sad, every time something's difficult, every time I'm anxious, all the bad stuff, I just put that plug in. Then before you know it, bam, you know, ready to go. And it always works. It's brought me thus far. I think that, you know, and it, it, it kind of helps with belief as well, because I think that faith is something that is perceived in the wrong way. People expect good things to happen for you to believe in it, which is the biggest lie in the world. Like, if you want me to be honest with you, the most successful people in life will start to tell you that actually when you have faith in something, then you manifest it, if you know what I mean. And obviously I read my Bible every day of my life. So all I ever read is faith, 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 faith. And actually, if you ask Joy, I share my stories with her all the time. <laughs> you know, and I'm sort of like, look, I prayed for this and then this happened and it happened 10 times better than I thought it would because yeah. I had that faith, you know? So that's what, that's what I rely on heavily. Absolutely. Yeah, I guess because like I've, I've been through a lot of like mad stuff just in general in life. Yeah. Um, and at every point in time, I've come out okay. Mm -hmm. so I think it's similar in the sense of, you know, that thing of like, bad stuff has happened, I survive. Bad stuff happens, I keep going. So I think 
there's stuff that's happened to me that I'm like, nothing can be as bad as that. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it's like, if, if I survive that, I can survive anything. So I just have to keep going. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like a similar thing to what you're saying. Um, maybe not faith-based per se, but still like th bad things happen. You keep going. Like that's it. life, li that's life it. continues. Yeah. Life is a whole pile of challenges. And I think that, you know, yeah. Like I just think that you just have to just have, a belief if you want my advice personal one i see jesus christ by near hey guess what guys <laughs> you don't have to listen to me that's the that's the the beautiful part of life life is a free choice you see what i'm saying there's free will and i and i think that i've just surrendered my three but you know what it is if you think of it as a concept right when i do good things god i mean joy will would, would attest to this i say it's all the glory all glory to god right i always do it you know so like oh thank you but you know it's all glory to god but when I do bad things or when I make mistakes, I take the pressure off myself as well. If you know what I mean, I think that things that are, as a concept of just taking the pressure off yourself to be unapologetic about what you do. Do you see what I'm saying to you? How can you be overly excited and miss opportunities or be so sad if you know what I mean that you miss opportunities? Do you see what I'm saying to you? Stay in a perfect place in the middle where you can just exist and you can just proceed. And I think that actually in any industry you'll go into, football, film, you know, music, whatever that is, I think that mentality goes first. And that's that's what people need to start understanding. Like mentality and the way your brain thinks actually is very testament to where you're going to get in your chosen field. Like you're never going to become Martin Scorsese if you don't believe you can achieve the same things. You'll become as as much as your brain will allow you to imagine, if you know what I mean. See, you can achieve it. Last question before we have to go. Um, Abigail Sewell. Uh, she'd love to hear about your process of making shot lists. How did you manage to narrow a shot list down from 80 to 30? And you know what, yeah, I will say this before Kobe answers. Kobe has a habit of always having so many damn shots. <laughs> haircut, I remember the final day of haircut. My man came in with like, what was it, almost 100 shots? Yeah, I had a couple of shots. Like, How are you doing this, Kobe? Kobe goes, God will provide. <laughs> God will provide me. Trust me, that's that's the, always my answer. You know, God will always provide, and He did. Like the ones that don't need to be got won't be got. If you know what I mean, and the ones that do will be got. So, I think that the way I do my shot list, I all, always overcompensate. I think that the more the merrier because it's easier to subtract than add. You know, if if you're if you're underprepared and you come on set and you start to try, and you know what though, having said that, on oaks and crosses, me and the DOP kind of came together. We spent all our time during prep together we speak about films he's watched haircut you know we speak about loads of different things and so on the floor sometimes you realize that you know what we did is we just actually just freestyled we just block the scene and allow the actors to lead and where they feel like they'll move and attach emotion to their movements and let the actors be free like make it a stage again you know and make it like theater and then me and the dop will go and get the coverage around that if you know what i mean and it works like a treat you know and i think that you know I think you can do that when you're prepared. I'm not saying that don't prepare and then go and just be organic, if you know what I mean, on, on the floor. I mean, prepare and have your shots and overcompensate and all these different things. But I think because I do that and I realise that that's not exactly what I'm going to capture, I go on set and I, I, I do my rehearsals with my actors, which is my one of my favourite parts of directing. And my DOP is someone that I trust heavily, so he's always there. He's good at being like a fly on the wall and observing what's going on in the scene, why actors are making decisions, where they could potentially move and where they do actually move in the rehearsals. And then we get coverage around that. And then the shots that I've got to establish the scene and close the scene will go in and around that in the edit. But that's how I usually like to work in a really organic way. Cool. Um, I Two minutes. I think, I think Tom's come to end Sorry. our wonderful session, guys. <laughs> you know, face, of, face of Doom has turned up. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing though guys thank you so so much we had um we i sent you a link to all the uh comments we've had all like people being chatting to each other for it so they had some really nice things we're gonna uh, capture those and send them to you both so uh there's a lot of love for the prayer of you out there to say the least um and one thing i forgot to say is joy congrats on the uh, vision award as well <laughs> Woo! Big thing. really big thing um but, yeah, <laughs> That was amazing. Um, just to say as well, we have another one of these talks uh, next Wednesday the 6th with Anna Burtmark, who worked with Joy, obviously, on Blue Story, uh, which is just around on sound design. She's having a conversation with William McGregor, so they're talking about their work together, but it's mainly, mostly on uh, sound and 
um, how the, how she works. That's really good. so that should be online next week at three on Wednesday the six. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kobe and Joy. Really, really, really enjoyed that. It was really thank good. You. And, uh, thank you for the thank yeah. you for the invite. It was a pleasure. Thanks, thanks, mate. That was really no yes. real pleasure for us to have you. So thank you so much. Yes, cool. yes. And thank everybody, you. when you hear about haircuts in cinemas, everyone <laughs> grab those we'll tickets. Yeah. Grab those tickets, tell your friends to watch it, and go and watch Noughts and Crosses if you haven't, right? On BBC iPlayer, make sure you all watch it. Tell your grandparents, parents, everybody. <laughs> Let's get this cracking, man. Cool. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Stay well, and um, yeah, Please. take care. Speak to you soon. Have a good day. Stay Bye. safe. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.